Hi, I'm Dr. Sam Lamb. I'm the program chair for Berlin, the ICHRS meeting coming October 23rd and 25th of this year. I'm here with Dr. David Saceda, who is a world famous a hair surgeon, as well as a dermatologist who's done a lot of research. He's published over 100 publications on all different types of hair diseases. He's going to be lecturing to us about frontal fibrosing alopecia. And uh, welcome, David. Welcome. Thank you very much. And tell us a little bit about what your talk is going to be on. Well, I'm going to talk about one of the most common hair disorders. It is frontal fibrosing alopecia. You know, this is an autoimmune disease and the cases are increasing over the last decade. So it's very interesting to know the disease, how to treat it, and how can we manage those patients in our consultation. Perfect. I, I actually uh, was attracted to one of the lectures you've given recently, and that's why I've invited you as one of the keynote speakers. What do you think in general is the major causative reason for FFA in your opinion? Well, probably there are multiple causes. Uh, of course, there is a genetic background. It has been always been there, but there must be some new environmental factors. That is the main concern of our patients and also for researchers. From my point of view, probably the hormonal exposure plays a role. Hormonal exposure means maybe oral contraceptives, hormonal treatments, and who knows if some ingredients from cosmetical products that may have some hormonal action may act to trigger the disease in a specific, uh, in, in genetically predisposed patients. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I've noticed something that has been, uh, in some literature has supported this idea, in some literature it's not supported it, but I find that certain types of sunscreens that patients re use religiously every day has, be has been what I found to be a high uh, causative link. I don't know if you found that or, or what do you think? Well, you know, sometimes I have come across with some patients that tell us that story, that they started to use sunscreens over the last year, and after a while, they developed frontal fibrosis alopecia. Some of those cases, from my point of view, are just biased, but other cases make me think about that they may play a role. Probably it is not only the, the only cause for frontal fibrosis alopecia. From my point of view, it plays a role in developing the disease. Have you found um, a genetic, the specific genetic loci yet? Is that something as part of your research or not? It is. I am very lucky because I've been working with uh, an excellent team in genetics from London, Dr. John McGrath and Dr. Christos Tiotsios. Those are, have um, um, discovered the main losses related to the disease. And we had the opportunity to try the same genetic assays in Spain. And we found that the, exactly the, the same genetics um, may play a role in the disease. And one gene is very interesting because it's a cytochrome. This cytochrome is CYP1B1. And this cytochrome is related to the metabolism of hormonal ingredients or hormonal products. So that makes us think that maybe there are some hormonal environmental stuff around us. Interesting, that's what you mentioned. So um, I know a core part of your talk is about the management of this disease. What do you think is the current management scheme for uh, FFA? Well, first of all, we have to think about anti-inflammatory uh, ingredients or drugs, right? So we must use topical um, agents. Among all of them, of course, a topical corticosteroids or topa, topical uh, calcineurin inhibitors play a role, uh, but there are some news about it because um, there are also jack, jack inhibitors, topical jack inhibitors, and I am having very good and experiences with topical ruxolitinib, for instance. So I think that it's going to be more and more common to use those treatments. In traditional injections of steroids or, or oral hydroxychloroquine are also there and we can use it in some patients, of course. And after that, uh, we must use other oral in, uh, drugs that have been proven to be effective to stop the disease, like oral dutasteride or oral minoxidil, uh, those uh, in a specific hair treatments may play a significant role in stopping the progression of the hair loss. 
I found that really fascinating. I think that was in one of your talks about uh, oral dutasteride actually having a direct role beyond AGA or androgenic alopecia, but something very specific in, in terms of its effect on FFA. I found that very interesting. Um, what do you think about uh, a way to prepare someone for, I know you're a hair surgeon as well, like, um, you know, we talked classically about two years of no active disease. Um, is that biopsy proven? Obviously, clinical disease, you're not going to see clinical advancement. What are your criteria to get someone ready for surgery if you're going to operate on them? Well, first of all, we, we have to assess the extension of the alopecia. We cannot um, make a hair surgery if the extent of the alopecia is too, too high. Uh, mm -hmm. We can repair uh, probably one or two centimeters in the frontal area at most, um, but we can be more confident treating patients and making surgery in patients with a uh, higher grades of alopecia in the temporal areas. This temporal area um, fits very well with um, this um, hair, with, with a hair transplantation. Uh, another very important stuff is to assess the inflammatory activity of the disease. If there is inflammation, it is not a good idea to make a hair surgery. And third and lastly, um, I always uh, get my persons ready with some a PRP injections before hair surgery. I am very lucky. Uh, I can do this treatment uh, most of the times even for free to my patients because I we have a lot of educational programs. So I try to include all the patients in that uh, in that in those programs before surgery. Uh, I have had very good experience treating them previously with PRP uh, because sometimes the local skin atrophy may um, it may provoke bad results after hair surgery. So if you do PRP before and probably after surgery, the rate of success is high, in my opinion. Interesting. I'm sure I, I could ask you forever about those protocols, but we'll hear about that during your talk, so we won't go into it. Mm. Um, but one other question before we close. With JAK inhibitors, um, do you find that uh, if they're already on it as a preparatory way to pre uh, minimize and prevent the disease process, can you restart that in corticosteroids during, this, uh, during the post-operative period after surgery? When do you resume that? That won't conflict with graft survival. That's very good. That's a very good question. Uh, we don't really know because we have just started to use these topical drug inhibitors, you know. But uh, from a point of view, every treat, every patient can start or restart topical therapy after two to four weeks after surgery. So, in my opinion, there is no problem in starting those treatments in that period of time. Thank you so much, Dr. Seseda. I'm very, very pleased to have you at Berlin. He's also going to be part of a panel on scarring alopecia that uh, I believe was on Thursday afternoon on the 23rd. So uh, we're going to have a lot of his expertise um, uh, in Berlin. I hope all of you can come. And I, I could talk to you for another three hours. I, I just have to withhold not any more questions <laughs> because people got to come to Berlin. So thank you again. Thanks a lot. I'm looking forward to seeing you all there. We are too.